Son Excellence, Monsieur Michael Higgins, président de l'Irlande, a bien vouloir monter à la tribune. Uktron Pablo Knafranke, Monsieur le Président, dear friends, I wish to thank President Hollande for his invitation to be here and to address you today on the theme of the power of ideas for climate, making a new beginning. May I congratulate the President of France on his initiative, and my hope is that our sharing of perspectives will help yield the positive result that we all need from the World Conference here in Paris at the end of November. Climate change is the great challenge of our time, already challenging most severely those already poor, for whom, if we do not act, it will deliver devastation. And ours may be the final generation with the opportunity to effectively respond to the now urgent, uncontested effects of climate change. So this year, 2015, marks a defining moment for the future of humanity. In this year, we will decide on what must be a shared universal response to climate change and on a practical agenda for action and measures for accountability. We will also, of course, this year decide on what should be sought as development in the wake of the Millennium Development Goals. We will have to develop a new response to global poverty, increasing global inequality, at a time of increasing global inequality. The meetings in Addis Ababa, New York, and again here in Paris, taken together then, constitute a sequence of proximate and interlinked moments where the governments of the world are confronted with urgent choices, choices that cannot be avoided for the present and particularly for future generations. But yet, if these challenges exist, the opportunities too are there. Leaders and their representatives, as we have heard, are presented with opportunities to construct a new order for humanity and our planet. The political and technical decisions that are to be made over the coming months may be complex. And I so salute those who are working on that complexity. But ultimately, the great challenges of our time are ethical and intellectual in their nature. It is especially fitting, then, that we have been offered this opportunity by President Hollande to consider what are questions of conscience and within conscience, intergenerational justice, and that we do so here in Paris, a city at the heart of a great French intellectual tradition. Whether we succeed or fail in the work ahead will be determined, I believe, by the response we bring to what is now the irrefutable evidence of science. But too, we will be challenged as to the degree of our moral courage our ethical values, and the inspiration that we can call upon, and the inspiration we can bring forth. We need to break away from a destructive relationship with the diver diversity that is the life on our planet, towards a new paradigm of existence, one that will be built on the respect we must have for the wonderment and renewal of nature, once available to all people, poor and not so poor. But we must begin with an acceptance of the evidence of science. And in that, we have made significant progress. It is now clear that failure to respond to the scientific reality of climate change may ultimately lead to the destruction of life on our planet. We must therefore unequivocally reject the position of those who would obscure the scientific reality of climate change in their protection of any narrow and short-term self-interest. The first ethical test is in accepting that there can be no compromise with truth. We must also reflect on the historical pathway 
that has brought us to this point. It cannot be evaded, nor should it be avoided. Climate change has come about, has an intellectual origin in a hubris that regarded nature as a subject for domination and exploitation. We must acknowledge that the human causes behind climate change have identifiable historical contexts grounded in forms of development and industrialization that were based on the exploitation of, for example, fossil fuels, with an assumption of infinite growth. So the complex questions of duties, justice, and balance must be considered with this historical context and legacy in mind, and with acceptance of the ecological debt that is owed by the more developed nations to those nations who continue to aspire to an equal world of opportunities, even of sufficiency, for freedom to achieve sufficiency, and a human flourishing with sustainability. Extreme individualism, manifesting itself as insatiable consumption, and accompanied by unconscionable levels of inequality, characterizes much of what is regarded as the developed part of our planet. For some, it is the single truth of our times, a hegemonic model that cannot be contested, somewhat like the times of Galileo Galilei. The narrow paradigm of progress now threatens the destruction of the habitat which our fellow humans inhabit, as well as precipitating unsustainable levels of poverty and inequality in our human communities with all their consequences. Many, as Teddy Swearingen has put it, are living on this planet as if we had another one to go to. Yet at the heart of most cultures, there is, I believe, a disposition towards ethics. I have encountered it in the young and in the old and in different places of the world. A disposition that goes beyond reciprocity, that seeks to transcend and is in harmony with the wonder of nature. And one of the great lessons also of the history of humanity is that we are regularly presented with an opportunity to embrace new possibilities, to break away from failed paradigms and modes of thought. Ideas and the triumph of idealism over self-interest were what inspired us in 1945 to seek a new world that might be based on solidarity and, for example, the universality of human rights. That was acknowledged by such as Albert Einstein, who famously said with an extraordinary prescience, we shall need a substantially new way of thinking if humanity is to survive. So now, as in 1945, a new normative framework is needed. We need to confront the hegemonic ethic of individualism in its extremes. We need to confront insatiable consumption that is at the roots of our behavior, and replace it with a new thinking which reconnects us to our planet of diversity, and which seeks and sets a new balance between the discourses of economics, ethics, and an integrated ecology. For this task, we will need new tools, the crafting of which can be the most exciting intellectual opportunity of our time, reconciling science and ethics. There is cause for optimism that this new thinking is emerging, the return of interest to the age-old human institution of the commons, the interdependence and shared responsibility that that encapsulates is but one example. In the spiritual traditions, and I instance contemporary writings such as Laudato Si, the concept of ecology of integration is now prominent. And in turn, from the tradition of human rights, the theories of climate justice and of, and of environmental rights as human rights have come forward and taken root. All of these valuable intellectual and spiritual contributions and the examples I have instanced of both can, I believe, combine to inform a new ethical framework on which a new harmonious and sustainable paradigm, not only of development, but of true security can be built. We must accept, however, 
that the moral imperative for action will not necessarily flow from any simple presentation of a case from reason, revelation, or understanding. We must be candid about the global capacity for change, the obstacles to change, and we must recognize that to reconstruct our models of economics and development will involve many instances, in many instances, swimming against the tide. It will involve, require moral courage. We must be realistic, too, about the current state of our law and politics. Our current malaise is grounded in a cynicism that we must confront and despair. There is, too, among our citizens a disconnect with representative and deliberative democracy that we must recognise and set about to heal. We need inclusive, humane and non-judgmental engagement with the voices of those most affected by climate change, and we must place them at the centre of the proposed solutions. <clears throat> I perceive among the populations of the world, and especially among the young, a search for beauty and a yet retained sense of awe at the harmony of nature. Among the elders of the planet, there is also respect for the potential of the inherited wisdom of the world released in the world to inform institutions and policies in new circumstances. When history records the actions we take or fail to take at this our moment of truth, we will not have the excuse either that we did not understand, that we did not know. We have been gifted in a global communications order with the knowledge and the opportunity to act. Would it not be the greatest of all human achievements, however, if we were to succeed in delivering the benefits of science, the shared wisdom, instinct and intuition of diverse cultures and the products of reason and faith, and in delivering all of these through new balanced models of development, ecology and society? Then we might say, that when facing the fullness of our challenge, we made the decisions that offered a shelter, that protected the vulnerable of the present, and at the same time, offered creative and imaginative possibilities for future generations. In this, let us succeed together.